Today we're going to be looking at where probably the most self-consciously literary um, tales that we'll be reading in this course. Uh, it's Angela Carter's The Bloody Chamber and the Company of Wolves. Um, now, they may seem in some ways out of place in a lot of the rest of the things you've been reading, but uh, one of the things that Carter does that I find particularly interesting is draw out the horrific implications um, of a number of fairy tales um, in the interest of overturning social hierarchies and gender hierarchies uh, that we find in a lot of these stories. Um, and she's in, a lot, she's in a way kind of like defamiliarizing tales that we already know and presenting them to us in a way that is intended to bend perception, uh, much as uh, the, the function of the weird, um, as we've seen. Uh, seems to be, right? So, one thing that's interesting about fairy tales as a subject for revision, and this is something we'll develop a little bit later on, but I just want to introduce the idea to you now, is that we always read revisions or new versions of fairy tales with what we regard as the original in mind. So reading tales like The Bloody Chamber or The Company of Wolves kind of automatically involves us in um, an act of, a mental act of comparison, right? We can't help it, right? We rely on our understanding of the original story of Bluebeard, the original story of Little Red Riding Hood, in order to make sense of Carter's tale. And so, a lot of what she's doing here is upsetting what we think we already know about the relationships to, uh, the relationships of um, a set of known texts to the world that we grew up in. So this is Angela Carter at around the time that she wrote these tales in the late 70s. So several of the stories in this collection first appeared actually not in pulp magazines, uh, which had by and large gone the way of the dodo by the 1970s, uh, but in outlets like Vogue and um, even uh, BBC Radio 4. Um, the, uh, the Snow Child was originally um, uh, fourth program radio script. The full collection of revised and retold fairy tales is published as The Bloody Chamber and Other Stories by Galanche in 1979. Now, Galanche, by the 70s, had an established reputation um, as a publisher of poetry and literary fiction and as a publisher of science fiction and fantasy. Now, their early reputation was established in the 20s and 30s as a publisher of explicitly left-wing literature as well. So, Galanche had a long history of publishing texts that questioned existing social hierarchies. Um, the Bloody Chamber won the Cheltenham Festival Literary Prize in 1979, and was published nearly concurrently with Carter's nonfiction book, the Saudian Woman and the Ideology of Pornography, um, which was a sort of feminist reclamation of the work of the Marquis de Sade. Essentially, Carter's argument was that de Sade was about the first male European um, author to see women as anything other than mere objects, right, as participants in pleasure. Now, that may seem a strange reading of Desaad if you're familiar with him, given uh, the things we know of the characters in, in his novels do to women. But the idea that women can feel pleasure as well as men 
um, Carter seems to attribute to this sort of something new that develops in uh, Desaad. Now the werewolf stories, there are three of them in this collection are adapted into a film called The Company of Wolves uh, by the Irish director Neil Jordan in 1984. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, The Crying Game or Michael Collins or Breakfast on Pluto. These are more famous films that Jordan has done. The Company of Wolves was his second film. And it bears really kind of only a passing resemblance um, to Carter's stories. Uh, but it is still, it's, it's an interesting viewing experience. Um, it's, it's not quite an art film, it's not quite a horror film, it sort of goes somewhere in between. Um, liminality, yay. So, why revisions of fairy tales, right? What is it that drew Carter to work with fairy tales? I think first it would be a good idea to draw a distinction between the fairy tale and the folk tale. We tend to use these terms almost interchangeably, but they don't really refer to the same thing. A folk tale comes from oral tradition. There are usually variant versions. They're told by a peasant audience to a peasant audience. Right? These are sort of like the oral history and you know the collected knowledge of the common people. And in some ways, they are socially subversive. Think of the old wives' tales in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. That Ichabod Crane is so eager to swallow, and that ultimately lead him and his rapacious ways out of the village. The fairy tale, on the other hand, is the fixed literary version of a folk tale. It has an identifiable author, is written for a bourgeois or upper class audience, and tends to be socially conservative. There is very little that's subversive in your average fairy tale. They tend to be highly moralistic, highly paternalistic, and they celebrate and reinforce a hierarchical culture. Fantasy castles and all that. So, if we think about class hierarchy in a typical fairy tale, we do often see some level of social mobility in a fairy tale. The peasant's daughter will marry the king, the miller's son will become a duke, that sort of thing. But this is relegated to special individuals who follow the rules especially well, right? They get to move up because in some sense they deserve it. And this change in state does not typically affect those around them, right? The villagers don't have a revolution and overthrow the ogre and then start ruling themselves in an anarcho syndicalist commune. A special individual is elevated from the rest and becomes a king or a queen. There are also issues of gender relations that make fairy tales interesting to someone writing from a feminist perspective, as Carter is, right? Um, fairy tales are often really misogynistic, and right, young girls are punished for curiosity about things they shouldn't be curious about, for disobeying parental authority figures or other authority figures, um, for indulging in any way symbolic sexuality. And I think that what Carter is trying to do in a lot of these tales is return these conservative fairy tale narratives to the more subversive common people celebrating revolutionary folktale tradition. Now one thing that's also interesting about the fairy tale or the folktale is that 
they tend to involve figures who are in a liminal stage of life. And the rites of passage that those individuals go through um, into adulthood. Now, the rites of passage in most of these stories seem to be primarily sexual. But let's talk a little bit first, for those of you who aren't sure what this term means, about what liminality is and why it matters. Okay, liminality is a term first coined by the anthropologist Arnold van Gennep in 1906, but further developed by Victor Turner in a 1967 book called The Forest of Symbols. The Forest of Symbols. So the word is derived from a Latin word, limen, which means threshold. And for Turner, it refers to the suspended or undecidable status of a ritual participant while the ritual is ongoing, right? Performing in a ritual changes your state in some sense, right? So if you are, uh, for example, in a church, you're participating in communion, right? You are in a different state once you've consumed the bread and wine than you were before. Right? You are a different kind of thing, at least temporarily. While you are drinking the wine and eating the bread, you are in a state that is neither what you were before nor what you will be afterward. That's a liminal state. Um, this term has been broadened out to refer to places or individuals that are caught between one state or another generally. Right, So liminal places might include, say, a forest clearing. Not quite forest, not quite field. Um, <clears throat> a beach, not quite ocean, not quite land. And liminal individuals would include um, adolescence. You're not a child anymore, but neither are you quite an adult. And the protagonists of most of Carter's fairy tales are women in that kind of liminal state, right? We have the 17-year-old musician married to the much older Marquis in the Bloody Chamber, based on Charles Perrault's Bluebeard fairy tale, and our little Red Riding Hood figure in the Company of Wolves, also based on a Perrault, a Perrault fairy tale called um, Le Petit Chaperon Rouge, right? Little Red Riding Hood. So the conventional fairy tale is what some philosophers of language would call phallogocentric. What does phallogocentrism mean? Well, it's a term coined in 1967 by the French philosopher Jacques Derrida. And it's a portmanteau word. That is, it's you know, two words smushed together. It's a portmanteau of phallocentrism, which refers to um, approaching things from a masculine point of view, and logocentrism, in which written language is the ultimate guarantor of meaning. So you put those two together, phallogocentrism, this refers to the way in which text-based traditions, like the fairy tale, privilege masculinity as a sort of as normative, right? As normative and authoritative. The point of view of the average fairy tale is masculinity. It's usually um, when we talk about the rites of passage in a fairy tale, we're talking about sort of the induction of a child into the law of the father. Now, one of the ways in which phallogocentrism is enforced visually in film and in text um, is what is often called the gaze. So this term is coined by Laura Mulvey in 1975 and refers to the tendency in cinema to frame shots in ways that privilege the male protagonist's perspective, right? particularly when viewing a female subject. Right. The female subject framed 
from the point of view of the male protagonist as an object of desire. So this encodes ideas of dominance and control into gender relations in film and in text. And one of the things that's interesting about the stories in Carter's collection is the way she plays with this idea of the gaze and often puts the reader in unconventional positions in regards to the gaze. So in the Bloody Chamber, for example, we have some discussion of the Marquis' taste in literature, right? He has these um, pornographic books that he doesn't really mind his new wife discovering um, and looking over the illustrations. And, like She herself looks at these illustrations from the point of view of her husband, right? Who's looking over her shoulder and leering at the time. So that's a sort of conventional use of the gaze. The Marquis himself is described as a connoisseur of women's bodies and of female corruption. But his, kind of show, his connoisseurship is described to us not from his point of view, rather from the point of view of his young wife as he undresses her to, you know, to not yet consummate their marriage. This is all part of a power play on his part, right? He stripped me, gourmand that he was, as if he were stripping the leaves off an artichoke. But do not imagine much finesse about it. This artichoke was no particular treat for the diner, nor was he yet in any greedy haste. He approached his familiar treat with a weary appetite. And when nothing but my scarlet, palpitating core remained, I saw in the mirror the living image of an etching by Rops he had shown me when our engagement permitted us to be alone together. The child with her stick-like limbs, naked but for her button boots, her gloves shielding her face with her hand as though her face were the last repository of her modesty, and the old monocled lecher who examined her limb by limb. Right, the monocle is, we know that the husband wears one as well, and it's a sort of distancing device right, between, placed between him and the object of his gaze. But what's interesting about what Carter does here is instead of placing us in the position of the male gazer, she places us in the position of the female protagonist being gazed at, right? Who can see in the mirrors around her not only what she looks like to him, but what he looks like looking at her, right? Reflecting his gaze back upon him. Now, the Marquis is described in many ways as a late 19th century, early 20th century decadent aristocrat, right? We have uh, his taste in art, right? His preference for violent subjects um, in painters we know existed like Gauguin and Gustave Moreau, but the works that um, Carter ascribes them are fictional. They don't really exist. There's also his association with the lilies, right, with the funeral flower. It's sort of part of a broader association uh, with death attributed to this character. Right? Beauty and death. He views everything as a sort of jaded, detached connoisseur. Right? The attitude that he displays most frequently, except when his mask falls briefly after he discovers his, wife tra his wife's transgression, is this kind of detached amusement, right? Almost sneering amusement at everything. And he has clearly psychologic, formed a psychological connection between art 
sex and death. For example, um, his love of the aria from Wagner's opera, um, Tristan and Isolde, uh, the Liebestod, right, the death of love, which is sort of, you know, it's, you know, Isolde's piece at the end of the opera. She is, uh, you know, you know sort of her, her heart is breaking over the death of her lover, Tristan. We also see that his face is described as a kind of ageless mask. Right? There are silver streaks in his beard, but his face is white, waxen, not lined by experience. And there are some suggestions um, that he may be some sort of immortal undead. Right? The Marquise, who raided the coast of Brittany, chasing women with dogs, hunting them down um, in the Middle Ages, may actually not have been his ancestors, but may have been him himself. There's that particularly grisly uh, passage that Jean-Yves, the uh, piano tuner, relates about um, the Marquis pulling the head of the blacksmith's wife out of uh, his saddlebag. Now, the gaze functions a little bit differently in the company of wolves. So let's compare these two passages, right? First, he strips off his shirt. His skin is the color and texture of vellum. A crisp stripe of hair runs down his belly. His nipples are ripe and dark as poison fruit, but he's so thin you could count the ribs under his skin if only he gave you the time. He strips off his trousers and she can see how hairy his legs are. His genitals are huge. And secondly, the firelight shone through the edges of her skin. Now she was clothed only in her untouched integument of flesh. This, thus dazzling naked, she combed out her hair with her fingers. Her hair looked white as the snow outside, then went directly to the man with red eyes. Now what happens here is that both the male werewolf and his female Victim's not even quite the right word here, right? Are both subject to the desiring gaze, right? Both are described in terms that emphasize their sexual appeal. The sexual appeal of their bodies, right? They're both framed as objects of desire. And as they go through the usual um, the usual Little Red Riding Hood formula. Starting on page 151, right? It actually begins here with Red Riding Hood asking the wolf what to do with her clothes. It says, eh, you won't need them. Into the fire with the two, my pet. What big arms you have, all the better to hug you with. Every wolf in the world now howled a prothalamian outside the window as she freely gave the kiss she owed him. A prothalamian, by the way, is a, is a pre-wedding song. What big teeth you have. She saw how his jaw began to slave her, and the room was full of the clamor of the forest's liebestoad. But the wise child never flinched, even when he answered, all the better to eat you with. The girl burst out laughing. She knew she was nobody's meat. She laughed at him full in the face. She ripped off his shirt for him and flung it into the fire in the fiery wake of her own discarded clothing. The flames danced like dead souls on Valpurgis knots, and the old bones under the bed set up a terrible clattering. But she did not pay them any heed. So, <clears throat> She turns the narrative around on the wolf, right? By refusing to be afraid, by refusing to be intimidated by his strength or by his sexuality. Right? She turns it right back on him. She laughs when he says something threatening. It's like, yeah, no, I am, I am not merely a piece of meat for you. She's insisting on her own personhood, her own subjectivity, and that she's doing this of her own free will. 
right? There's consent implied here. This is not an assault. Now, one important aspect we haven't really talked about here yet is how these tales frame relationships between women. So in the bloody chamber, we have the daughter, the narrator, worried that her marriage to her marquee breaks in some way the mother-daughter bond. Right, so if we look on, well, page one, And I, remembered, I remember I tentatively imagined how, at this very moment, my mother would be moving slowly about the narrow bedroom I had left behind forever, folding up and putting away all my little relics, the tumbled garments I would not need anymore, the scores for which there had been no room in my trunks, the concert programs I'd abandoned. She would linger over this torn ribbon and that faded photograph with all the half-joyous, half-sorrowful emotions of a woman on her daughter's wedding day. And in the midst of my bridal triumph, I felt a pang of loss, as if, when he put the gold band on my finger, I had in some way ceased to be her child in becoming his wife. Now the mother, we know, has had an adventurous history. And the daughter, unlike her mother, who married for love, has married for financial security. So if we look a little bit further here on page two, right? Are you sure? She'd said when they delivered the gigantic box that held the wedding dress he'd bought me, wrapped up in tissue paper and red ribbon like a Christmas gift of crystallized fruit. Are you sure you love him? There was a dress for her too, black silk, with the dull prismatic sheen of oil on water, finer than anything she'd worn in that, since that adventurous girlhood in Indochina, daughter of a rich tea planter. My eagle-featured indomitable mother, what other student at the conservatoire could boast that her mother had outfaced a junk full of Chinese pirates, nursed a village through a visitation of the plague, shot a man-eating tiger with her own hand, and all before she was as old as I? Now, the, the mother has abandoned her colonialist fortune and life of adventure to marry a poor soldier who later dies. The daughter is marrying a rich man who frightens her, in large part because he can offer her a life of luxury the mother didn't. And yet, it's the mother who shows up bearing the father's phallic symbol, the revolver, to protect and avenge her daughter. And then they forge a life together with the ineffectual blind male piano tuner lover, largely outside the realm of masculine authority as represented by the Marquis. So here we have a mother-daughter bond reinforced by a bad marriage, right, by a failed marriage. Now, in the company of wolves, we get something rather different. The grandmother is here a kind of transmitter of symbols of traditional authority. You know, we have the Bible on the table, right? The, the, uh, the, young, the young girl knows something is up when she sees the Bible closed on the table. The grandmother is the victim of the wolf before he comes after the girl and is in fact devoured by him. The grandmother, who is subject to these traditional definitions of authority, these traditional morals, is eaten by the wolf. But the granddaughter seems weirdly liberated by both her grandmother's death and by her sexual encounter with the werewolf, right? She falls asleep between the tender paws of the wolf. So here, in this story, the relationship with the older generation of women seems like an impediment rather than an empowerment. So 
I point this out to show that this is not cons that these relationships are not portrayed consistently across all of these tales. And I would uh, I would encourage you to think about why this is so. What's different about the what differences are there between the mother in the bloody chamber and the grandmother in the company of wolves that would lead to these separate outcomes? All right, so last thing we're going to be reading in this course is China Mieville's novel, The City in the City. So primarily this is about two cities that occupy the same geographical space. So what I want you to think about first is how the cities of Bezhel and Okoma are organized and where and how they touch each other. You will also see a lot of references from the very beginning of the novel to something called breach, which is not really explained to us early on. So I want you to pay attention to every mention of breach. What is it and how important is it to the case that Inspector Borloo was working on throughout the novel? Now, much of the novel's plot hinges on um, events in an archaeological site that points to a shared past between Bejel and Okoma. So what do you make of the role archaeology and, archaeolo and archaeologists play in the novel? And finally, what is Orsini, what does it seem to want, and how do Borlu and his compatriots track it down? All right, and then that'll be it for the course. Um, so we'll see you next time to talk about China Mieville.